So I would like to invite Dr. DeLeon. Um, she's a graduate of University of Santa Thomas School of Medicine. She's both certified in family medicine and also certified with the U.S. Department of Education and Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. Uh, she completed her family medicine residency and also her hospice and palliative medicine fellowship at UT Houston. Um, she has authored presentations at regional meetings in the advancement and development of palliative care. She's currently practicing supportive and palliative medicine at Houston Methodist Hospital, and she's also the adjunct assistant professor of Texas A&M School of Medicine. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, okay, so bear with me. If I do cough, I am recovering, <laughs> so I'm gonna keep my mask on and my water here. So hopefully everybody's still awake. Um, I thought I was listening online for, for the whole day and I think this, uh, the conference is excellent because a lot of the topics that were discussed, including up to rehab and up to the end, actually incorporates palliative approach already. So uh, this is a, maybe like a, a lot of patients um, have, have gone through post-stroke uh, disabilities and comorbidities. So my topic today is actually very appropriate. It's the increasing role of palliative care in stroke. Okay. So everybody knows that palliative care focuses on improving quality of life um, and alleviating suffering for patients with serious illness. I think everybody's heard this repeatedly. This presentation will discuss palliative care as it applies to patients with neurologic conditions, focusing mainly on stroke. I have no disclosures, forgot to put that on the slide. <laughs> so I mentioned palliative medicine because at times people forget that it is a specialty. Um, we, like to do, we like to use the term palliative care because it sounds more caring, obviously. But it is a specialty which aims to recognize, prevent, alleviate suffering and improve quality of life for patients with a serious, advanced, chronic medical conditions or terminal conditions. Uh, this is the definition of the World Health Organization since 2002. There is a new term coming uh, out re recently, uh, and it's mentioned repeatedly in the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, in the American Academy of Neurology. It has been mentioned as the term neuropalliative care, or palliative neurology, and they put it together. It's an odd combination, but surprisingly, it's appropriate. Uh, it is a, an approach to care that focuses on optimizing symptom management, functional status, addressing goals of care, discussing advanced directives, and engaging in shared decision making throughout the course of the disease. Okay, another thing I wanted to clarify is that palliative care is often equated with hospice care. These terms are not interchangeable. Palliative care can be provided independent of a patient's prognosis, while hospice care is appropriate if a patient is nearing only the end of life or the terminal stage. So there is a general increase in the prominence of palliative care being involved in neurology in all different kinds of specialties since the year 2000. There has actually been an increase, like a 158% increase in studies showing that hospitals are incorporating this specialty into their departments and in the hospitals in the inpatient setting as well as the outpatient setting. Okay. So everybody knows this, I've been discussed all day, globally stroke kills about five million people annually. It was the leading cause of uh, chronic disability and the second leading cause of dementia worldwide. Unfortunately, patients who survived the initial period still face an all-cause mortality, 28% at 28 days, 41% at one year, and 60% at five years. So because of the technological advancements, there is a reduction in morbidity and mortality. And it was mentioned earlier also that it was the third leading cause of death in 2007, went down to the fifth leading cause of death in 2013, and last year, the recent study that I didn't get to put in there is that it was the eighth leading cause of death. Uh, I think it was September or November of 2022. So with the baby boomers coming into age where the average stroke is coming, stroke and stroke death is anticipated to double from the year 2002 to 2032. I think the big, uh, the big issue is the COVID pandemic. It took a little bit higher up in the, 
in the, the rankings of the leading cause of death the past two years. Okay, so the impact of stroke. Uh, clinicians will face an increased number of survivors along with family and caregivers who will experience a wide range of physical, psychosocial, and existential challenges. These high rates of morbidity and mortality after a stroke emphasizes the importance for clinicians to integrate palliative care, both in the acute and the post-acute systems of stroke care. So everybody knows the stroke trajectory. It is unlike cancer. It does pose a difficulty and complication with our team most of the time. It's unlike heart failure, uh, which we see a lot also. It's unlike dementia and other serious illness in a sense that the onset is sudden and abrupt. Uh, there's little or no time to prepare patients, to prepare families, to talk about considering values and what treatment preferences the patient will have. Um, and normally, usually, it's followed by a rapid decline from normal baseline. So it's a new state of health for the patient and the families. Many patients are unable to participate in treatment decisions early on, and so families are tasked with decisions based on what patients would want or what their wishes would be. Most patients who die after a stroke usually do so in the setting of withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, unfortunately, in a facility. Uh, some in the hospital, some in skilled nursing. Those who survive, though, face a prolonged trajectory of improvement as well as increased risk of morbidity and mortality in the future. Therefore, the models of palliative integration and communication skills need to be adapted to this trajectory. So the stroke trajectory, you can see death, coma, persistent vegetative state. They can improve with or without disabilities, which is why the rehab, physical therapy, speech therapies are all important. Common complications include infection, respiratory failure, falls, pressure sores, pain, depression, and so on. And the recovery of function may also be prolonged, could be three to six months or more, or even none. So these, are, these statistics were taken, they're basically telling us that there's a high mortality morbidity associated with acute strokes, and many of these patients and families will need specialized palliative care needs. So, post-stroke period of severity and course of illness are highly variable. Uh, there is the importance of symptom management, and I think everyone, every specialty or every multidisciplinary care for stroke involves symptom management symptom management for improvement of quality of life, which you will probably hear redundantly throughout palliative care if you consult us. <laughs> Some of examples are pain, fatigue, depression, anxiety, dysphagia, and a lot more. I'll go through, there's a whole chart that I made for common symptoms that we also help manage. Um, discussions on life-sustaining measures are very important. Um, artificial nutrition, <coughs> mechanical ventilation, and tracheostomy are also important. All these discussions need to happen, preferably ideally early on post-acute stroke. So goals of care need to be thoroughly discussed. So how do you integrate palliative care into stroke care? So in the field of neurology, there again I mentioned palliative neurology, there's actually a, 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 a fellowship in Denver that specializes uh, taking neurologists or residents into a fellowship, they call it neuropalliative care. So that started a couple of years ago. So in the field of neurology, there may be many diseases that are chronic, progressive, life-limiting, and very disabling, which were the bridge between palliative care and neurology exist. Current emergent interest is how to apply the palliative principles. You don't necessarily have to get us on board, just know the principles to care for the patients with underlying conditions. And some of the neurologists that I've worked with, mostly ICU, have developed these skills already. Some of them are excellent, and some are still a little, you know, in the beginner side and getting, getting used to discussing these things and using palliative care skills. <clears throat> so, um, so it is especially difficult, obviously, for stroke patients, and not just the patients, but the caregivers and the families are affected as well. Uh, there's a lot of loss of function, um, communication difficulties. Sometimes the patients are with it, but they can't communicate. Sometimes they're not with it. They have personality and memory changes. Uh, they have really, really prolonged disability. And most of the time, because they have a higher increase in mortality with another stroke, they're shortened, they have a very shortened prognosis. 
Uh, it can be, it's very disabling with a high symptom burden. The care of stroke patients present numerous opportunities to integrate palliative approach. Okay, so there it is again, redundant. <laughs> Improvement of quality of life. We do cover an interdisciplinary approach, which is quite different from just mostly specialties. We incorporate physical, psychological, social, and spiritual issues when we treat the symptoms, not just the physical, we look at the overall picture, which was what we call total pain, if it's pain. Uh, we improve communication. So communication is vital, not just with the patients and the families, but also with the specialist, the primary care, the neurologist, so that we can come up with a clear plan and options for these patients and families. Advanced care planning and goals of care discussions are very, very important, especially early on. Um, there's times where patients, stroke patients develop dementia or they get altered later on, so it is important while they're still kind of with it in the beginning to start having these discussions early. Medical decision-making capacity assessment is also very important, and it is a skill that you know you kind of learn. Um, there's only four elements that are needed for capacity. So also determining the surrogate decision-maker is also part of what we do. Um, patient caregiver or family member well-being and support is part of my interdisciplinary team for palliative care. That's why we have a social worker, we have a chaplain, um, now we have music therapists working with us as well. Um, and eventually end of life care. Unfortunately, a lot of these patients will eventually have to have this talk about end of life care. This includes hospice discussions as well as options for them. As you can see, I don't know if everybody's seen this before, but it's very common uh, from, uh, this is the simultaneous care model for palliative care. And it just tells you that palliative care can be on board even at the initial presentation of a serious illness or a terminal illness. We can be on board with curative treatment. Uh, it doesn't matter. Palliative care can still be a consult or seeing these patients and families. It goes on until we reach what we call hospice care, which is not interchangeable with us or palliative care. Hospice care is specifically at the terminal stage of the disease or end of life which is why the definition of the last six months of life. It doesn't necessarily mean the last six months, but given their diagnosis of stroke and other comorbidities, it could be that this could take their life within six months. Hospice care does continue beyond death uh, for bereavement and support, so they go beyond that. Okay. So post-stroke management includes rehab, control of risk factors, symptom management, psychological management, which you all heard today, improving the life of quality of life. Um, they usually have, but well, one third of them will have, patients will have difficulties uh, communicating. So after a stroke, so this can be challenging. So the advanced care planning is ideally, like I said, should be done early. There should be effective, emphatic, and honest communication. It should be the, the prognosis and uncertainties of the diagnosis of stroke or post-acute stroke should be discussed transparently with the patient, if they're aware, or with the families and caregivers. So the, usually the discussion involves a typical disease course, estimated prognosis, prognostic limitations, treatments, options, completion of advanced directives if possible, and goals of care. Consideration of artificial nutrition and hydration is also an important discussion early on. Loss of communication from the patient can have a high impact on, and burden on the patients and families. Okay, so these are the common uh, symptoms after stroke that we normally can help manage and everybody else you know, in other specialties and the primary neurologist can also manage. So the most common, one of the most common ones are the post-stroke depression, which was mentioned earlier uh, the previous presentation. The pseudobulbar affect, 2% or emotional lability. And it, I usually put the incidence here, the assessment tools, I'm not gonna go through all of that. And the possible managements that, you know, palliative care as well as other specialties can, can use to manage these symptoms. Um, there's anxiety, the incidence is 20%. Usually we like SSRIs and SNRIs. Benzos are usually uh, given, but only in severe cases because if they're already 
you know, um, disabled and they're already altered, we don't want to make them more drowsy or make them more lethargic. We want them awake to be able to do physical therapy and rehab. Uh, delirium is another one, 10 to 48% with stroke patients. So they have usually tried behavior modifications and we try to work with the team and see what the identified causes are. Antipsychotics, like you'll see Haldol. Some of my colleagues like to use it a lot. I don't. I only use it if there is really severe hyperactive delirium because you know you have the excitatory agitation coming from adverse effects on that. So I have my reasons for not using it all the time. But it's a very popular drug that palliative care will be using, especially and hospice as well. Dysphagia, uh, the incidence is about 20 to 50 percent. So there's the assessment tools. Rehab is very important. Chin tuck maneuver, special diet. We always, always discuss that the PEG tube, the NG tube has not been shown to prevent aspiration, but a time-limited <coughs> trial can help with nutrition. So if we want to give the patients a time-limited trial to see if they can recover, to see if they can get some strength to do some rehab, physical therapy, occupational therapy, then this is the way to go. We don't dissuade this unless we absolutely see no chance of a meaningful recovery, absolutely. So. Pain. Pain is probably one of the most common ones to manage. There's the central post-stroke pain, which is about 12% incidence rate. There's the hemiplegic shoulder pain, 4 to 8 to 84%. Usually they come from weakness or uh, chronic weakness on the left side. It depends on the kind of stroke and which side it is. Um, and they usually like to, so the, there's, the most common one is still headache for some reason. You know, I see it a lot. And the headache we like to manage with non, um, non-opioids at first, because I said we don't want them drowsy, we don't want them stuporous, we want them participating in physical therapy and rehab and whatever, you know, more quality of life. We only use opioids if the NSAIDs or the acetaminophen, they're not working. Um, we still have the amitriptyline, lamotrigine, and then we have electrical simulations, physical therapy, NSAIDs, you know, all this stuff denervation uh, procedure, there's also acupuncture, high heat strapling, sling, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, okay, so there's also post-stroke spasticity. The incidence is about 30%. We can do the botulinum injection, physical therapy, splint, orthosis, electrical stimulation, and antispastic agents like baclofen or tizanidine, usually baclofen five milligrams every eight hours, tizanidine two milligrams. If they are drowsy, I would not use it or at least use less of a dose for it. Uh, fatigue. Fatigue was mentioned earlier also. Uh, there's about 50% incidence of fatigue. Usually you use modafinil, amantadine, and methylphenidate. Methylphenidate we like to use uh, more on cancer patients, but it can be used on post-stroke patients as well. Um, and then we usually see how they respond for a short period of time. We don't like to keep them on it for a prolonged time, so we try to wean it down. Once they get a little bit stronger, they get a little bit better, the more nutrition. Okay, so there's also urinary incontinence, uh, incomplete emptying, stress incontinence, 50 to 20 percent. Um, usually try non-pharmacologic weight loss, bladder training, and all these other stuff. Um, and surgical usually is the last option, obviously. Uh, fecal incontinence is also another symptom. 10% usually happens around six months. Um, the treatment is supportive, so you try to give them less stool burden. Uh, you can use debulking agents or anti-diarrheals, uh, sacral nerve stimulation, and lastly, sphincteroplasty, but I would, that's rare. We don't normally use that. Okay, so seizures and epilepsy, uh, the incidence is about 5 to 12%. Obviously, we use anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, we do use anti-epileptic drugs in hospice as well. This is for comfort. We don't want patients having seizures, even though they're on comfort measures or hospice care. So not everything does stop. Um, sexual dysfunction, as much as it's not talked about as often, there is as high as 50% incidence rate in post-stroke patients. So they need a lot of counseling, medication review, depression screening is important. Um, and the efficacy of the phosphodiesterase inhibitors after a recent stroke is still controversial, so we don't know how effective it is. Uh, sleep disordered breathing, again, you know, the sleep study is high as 50%, so we do weight loss, CPAP or BiPAP if they need it. Okay, 
Those are the symptoms. They're not all there, but those are the most common stroke, post-acute stroke symptoms that we like to help manage as well. Now, after that, you have to think about end-stage issues, unfortunately. Uh, management of underlying symptoms to optimize the quality of life. Like I mentioned, advanced care planning, management of total pain, and then also the withdrawal of non-beneficial life-sustaining treatments. Notice I put non-beneficial, meaning that this patient is mostly likely in the inpatient or acute setting, and they are most likely not to have a meaningful recovery. We don't even consider withdrawal of non-beneficial life-sustaining treatments if this is not the case. Um, if the family is asking for this and you know the specialist or the neurologist doesn't agree yet, so we do have, this is where we, the, the discussions come into play, where the interdisciplinary family meeting is, is appropriate. Uh, many challenges include unpredictable course, sudden death, fluctuating course, long duration of the disease, and complex multidisciplinary care is usually, usually needed. So the withdrawal of non-beneficial life-sustaining treatments, it can be very complex. It's another presentation altogether. <laughs> um, but there are common symptoms. There are main seven symptoms that we normally manage when we do this. Uh, it's pain, shortness of breath or dyspnea, agitation, oral or oropharyngeal secretions, fever, nausea, vomiting, constipation, and those are the seven most common ones. In the stroke setting, I included delirium and seizures because those are also seen mostly when we have patients with a post-acute stroke. Uh, these are the main symptoms that we normally manage. We like to keep them on symptom management, comfort care, medications. Uh, palliative sedation is also used, and this is usually done only if the symptoms are uncontrolled. We do not use palliative sedation unless we have a reason to. Um, I had a patient once that was on pentobarbital in the, in the neuro ICU, and the family wanted to withdraw, but the neurologist was having difficulty because we, we can't withdraw when they're fully sedated like that. They have no chance of breathing on their own. They have no chance of survival. And that's pretty close to euthanasia. So legally, what they did was they sent out for the phenobarbital level, pentobarbital levels, and it was like two weeks. I guess it was a lab that was sent out. Finally, the family just signed and said, we don't want this to prolong it because she's not waking up and we want to withdraw. In that case, we got a written document, we got legal on board, we got, um, I believe, ethics on board, and we did proceed with the withdrawal even before the two weeks results are out because the family was just <laughs> suffering and they felt like the patient was suffering. There's no chance of her improving. So there are you have to have a reason. Documentation, communication is very important. Um, there's also the preference for organ donation. We don't normally interfere with organ donation in this hospital. There are some uh, hospitals that integrate organ donation with palliative care. Our team does not. We will mention it briefly and offer it, but the discussion itself is usually done by the organ donation or life gift, our team. They have their own team. Okay, so why is there a need for basic palliative care skills for a neurologist? Why? Because neurologists work to find cures for so many de devastating neurologic conditions and patients suffer tremendously on a daily, daily basis. Uh, patients and families face the reality of loss. It's a repeatedly re loss, loss of function, loss of ability to communicate, limited lifespan, uh, complications related to it. So they, they do suffer a lot. Um, and it's prolonged suffering sometimes or difficulties. So the unique aspects of palliative care neurology, because it's prolonged, it's fluctuating, unexpected declines happen, and impairments. There's also an enormous prognostic uncertainty with post-stroke patients. And there are very few validated prognostic markers that are actually 100% accurate, especially in post-acute stroke. And neurologists or neurolo ne neurology patients can lose mobility. Um, they can lose the communication ability, their cognitive function, even long before death. So neuropalliative care skill sets. These are the recommendations of the American Academy of Neurology. Um, this was started in 20, I believe it came out in 2019, 
and then they revised it and they actually made a statement uh, recently, this, this year, uh, last year, 2022, March. So effective, communica communicately, effective communication and prognosis is important. They want you to get estimates from literature, communicate the best case and worst case scenario, and manage the uncertainty. Easier said than done. <laughs> okay, so master common preference sensitive decisions, meaning know the major decisions within each subspecialty working with the patients and families, uh, elicit preference ac accurately, listen more than talk. So once you give the medical updates, once you talk about the prognosis, once you talk about the options, the prognosis, the limited time frame, then you listen. So you have to be hyper vigilant with shared decision making. Know how to know how to run family meetings. Um, be aware of cognitive biases, and use effective use of time limited trials. Like I said, have a plan. It doesn't mean the clinical trials for treatments. It means it could mean okay. Do we want to do continue the mechanical ventilation for how long? How long do we give this patient? Do we want to do a trach and give it a try for a limited time trial? So that's what the limited time trials are meant, uh, not necessarily the clinical treatment trials. Okay. So detect and manage whole body pain, um, psychological, existential, social, physical symptoms. Palliative options at the end of life. So these all were kind of the same skill sets for neuropalliative care, and as well as our own department, palliative care. We're drawing life sustaining treatments, palliative sedation, Voluntary stopping and eating and drinking is one of them. Some of the patients get very depressed and they just don't want to eat. They don't want to do anything. Physician-assisted dying. This is not legal in Texas. Uh, it is only legal in some states, so we don't do it. Um, and brain death determination. I think this is a whole other lecture that I did with another um, Dr. Green's group, I think. So that's also important. Okay. So conclusion. Um, the American Academy of Neurology calls on neurologists to acquire basic palliative care skills and recommend direct involvement in palliative care, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Okay, I talked as fast as I could because we were running late. <laughs> okay, any questions? No, everybody's still awake. <laughs> A comment. Yes. Um, you know, when we're in the neuro ICU, and um, I think we have, we know it's a catastrophic bleed. Like we know it's a catastrophic stroke. Um, just a comment for everyone is that sometimes I feel like I'm rushing the family to make a decision, mm -hmm. but I think it's so catastrophic for them that it takes mm -hmm. time for them to process mm -hmm. that. So I think the one comment I have is that we all need to listen more and talk less, mm -hmm. and let the family take their time. It might be a lot longer than you would think because we do this every day, so we forget sometimes. Yeah. So just a, it, just it, a comment. It, it's normal uh, to feel like that because it's it's happening right now, right then. It's very it's acute, you know, within 24 hours. Um, I guess because we see a lot of those, so for us coming in calm, uh, not panicking, <laughs> not sounding like we need an urgent decision right away, and mostly coming in just to support initially. But at the same time, usually with my patients and my families, I would like to say, so to time is critical. I don't know how long your loved one has, but it is not looking well, not looking good. Honest compassion, um, you know, try to empathize with them. Um, most of the time when they hear something simple and they usually respond better, uh, better than what you would expect. So, okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, I'm gonna go take my breath <laughs> from a recovery.